In this session from AI Exchange, we're talking with David Myers. David is a product management advisor at Broadcom. He's a member of the Intelligent Operations and Automation team responsible for delivering AI ops, predictive performance, and availability solutions for hybrid IT environments. Dave has extensive experience with DevOps methodologies across mobile, cloud, distributed, and system Z environments. He has 15 years of experience as a software engineer, working with government, banking, insurance, and finance customers. An automation team. So um, I'm sure you'll tell us a little bit more about what you do there. Sure. Um, so I'm here figuring out what's going on out there with our customers and what's going out there in the market and trying to help people understand what the next set of things coming out is to solve their day-to-day -day issues. Um, so as an example, AI ops, that's a new thing coming out. It's been around for maybe two years, so still pretty fresh, but I really wanted to help people understand, you know, what it is, you know, why is it coming about and, and where do you start? So just a little bit of background and hopefully get through this somewhat, somewhat quick is I'm sure everyone has experienced this, the way that customers and businesses interact, it's really shifted. It's changed. You know, for many of our traditional customers out there, it used to like in the finance industry, as an example, it used to be you go into a bank, you interact with the teller, you, you go in for a loan, uh, you talk person to person, then ATMs appeared and you sort of dealt less with the teller and more with the machine. And now, you know, you have your mobile phone. Um, personally, I was trying to think when was the last time I went into a bank? And I think I've been into an actual branch like once this year. You know, now Cyber Monday just passed. You do a lot of your shopping online, or even if you go into a store, you check prices on your phone versus what's on the shelf. So digital is really the way that the business is reaching out to customers now. It's making that whole IT system more and more important and more critical to what is actually happening out there. But behind the scenes, you know, these are things that have been built up over the last year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. You know, I've talked to some customers that have 35 year old code. These are the most complex systems you'll ever see. You know, I saw, you know, an example of just someone logging into their insurance, uh, their insurance website it had 45 or 50 steps as, you know, behind you entering your username and password. And the way that we've dealt with this sort of complexity in the operations realm has been, you know, taking these different pieces, these partner systems, these databases, now these cloud services, our storage, our network, our systems, and we've been creating specialties and specialists behind the scenes. You know, we have Bill who does that cloud service. We have Fred who handles databases. We have John who handles storage and Debbie who does network. Or that, There's always that guy in Secaucus, New Jersey out there on the other end of that, that network wire, right? So we've been creating these different specialties and these different people to handle them. And you know now what happens is when people leave, how do I replace that specialty? But you know beyond that, these systems are becoming more and more critical. So I first wanted to sort of explain what we see as the traditional way people have worked in this sort of system, right? We have these very complex systems, different people specialize in different parts of it, and they have different tools or different you know ways of interacting with those different things. We have our application management tools, our network management tools, our storage network tools, our database network tools, our infrastructure management tools, right? Each specialized for a different piece of that complexity. You know, Digital Experience Journal ran a study where people have 10 different tools to manage that back end. And what typically happens is I collect that data, I put it as some domain model where these highly skilled people understand what's going on in each of those distinct areas to figure out if anything's going wrong. But also, I need that view across everything. But this tends to be some lower skilled people up in a network operations center. You know, they're dealing with alerts and dashboards and drill downs. They're the ones who aggregate all that data from different places, triage it, investigate it, and quite commonly try and resolve anything that they find. Some usually via some ad hoc automation, some run books that you documented, or more quite commonly, bridge calls. And so, what do I mean by a bridge call? When we're running these very complex things, it usually happens to be that across the different domains, that's where the real problem lies. You know, it may be something in an application that triggers something on my network or overruns some storage. And these complex issues, 
they're held across these different silos. It's really, you can't find it in that one domain model. It ends up that you have to find it over there in, in that aggregation level, right? The problem is there's lower skilled people dealing with this. And usually they don't always have the answer on what to do. And so they reach out to those highly skilled people. And normally this is where we talk about the bridge call, right? Lots of people have to come together when something goes wrong. And when something goes wrong, now it's becoming more and more of an issue since this is exposed out through that digital channel to more and more end customers. And so that's where we talk about these three challenges I wanna just briefly go over today, which we call too much, too long, and too late. And so what do I really mean by that? So by too much, there's just lots of data, lots of complexity, lots of things to look at in terms of humans to analyze that effectively and efficiently. Here's just one example. You know, in that mess of stuff across those 10 different tools, feeding all those dashboards, you have that, that lower skilled person sitting there staring at the walls in the operations center. When something goes wrong, where do you start? You just have these walls of information. You know, it's a lot of overload and we're seeing more and more of it. We're seeing an 88% increase in that operational data coming through. We're seeing more and more false alerts popping up or duplication of those alerts between different tools. You know, personally just staring at that, how do I know if I need to take action on something? And even if I figure out I need to take action on something, we have a lot of manual processes behind the scenes. Uh, four and a half hours once something sort of appears is the average it takes to diagnose it and, and repair it or remediate it. What this ends up being is a lot of these issues are identified by the end users, or in the worst case, you get on that front page. You know, we have all these, all these newspaper articles nowadays talking about major IT failures, whether that's airline systems going down and you see queues of people just sitting there at the airport whether that's a banking outage where I cannot actually get access to my money or my credit card's not working, whether that's a retailer who can't process, um, who, who can't check out people. You know, these are things that appear and they impact your brand, they impact trust with customers, they result in lost revenue, regulatory fines. You know, we're losing millions of dollars a year in, in some of these things. This is always a worst case scenario, but these, this is what results when I have so much stuff to look at, I have people trying to stare at it and find those patterns and then trying to figure out what to take action on. So that traditional approach of what we've done across all those different places, it's at a breaking point. And that's where we see AI ops. So AI ops is this new space. It's a new category of solutions for this problem. And it, generally it's broken down as artificial intelligence for IT operations from Gartner. Sometimes people call it augmented intelligence for IT operations, but it all comes back to like three big points. It takes this platform approach where it combines big data, AI, and or machine learning to help implement and, and enhance these operational processes behind the scenes, including monitoring for availability or for performance. So instead of a human sitting there staring at that wall, we have a machine sort of looking for what's going on. Uh, whether that's correlation and analysis, trying to find that root cause, uh, whether that's service management, helping actually run through that triage and categorization process that I gave that, that manual Visio diagram thing for, or whether it's automation in terms of taking some action based on what's seen. You know, a lot of companies are starting to adopt this now. We have these modern architectures that are making that mess I showed even more complex. We're not getting rid of any of those 10 tools I mentioned because they all have their place and their purpose, but it introduces duplication and it introduces false alarms and a lot of fatigue in terms of too much stuff coming in. And it's just too much for humans to deal with anymore. And so now automation, we want to get to that automation and that self-healing system so we can reduce our cost, reduce risk, make sure we address things proactively. For, by 2022, Gartner says 40% of large enterprises are going to adopt this type of solution, right? So let me talk about why it's a little bit different, and then I'll get into what is, um, you know, how, how it's actually being approached. So at its core, it talks about big data. And what we have is we already have all these tools that do a great job of gathering application data around transactions, around metrics, around traces. We have network monitors that get you faults and performance. We get experience analytics, getting response time and conversions and all this. 
what AIOps really does at its core is it brings all that stuff together in a big data cache or a big data uh, data lake. This is a place where I can now have one place to sort of look at and investigate. It streams all these things in in real time so it can help drive real time decision making. And just looking at that after we aggregate all that data up, this is where it sort of changes how we go about things. In that traditional model, we took that domain data, we put it in a model, we did some analysis on it, aggregated it, alerted it on it, and then drove to automation. Now we're sort of flipping it around. We start off by aggregating all that data together first. And then from that mass of all that big data stuff sitting in there, we apply the machine learning and, and analytic algorithms, such as alert noise reduction, get rid of all those duplicates out there, such as identifying the root cause. So we look for causation and correlation using statistical models or machine learning algorithms. And then do predictions as an example. So we can see that you know, your storage started to fill up, then your application server started to slow down and you saw a slowdown in mobile response time. We can actually use that to predict when you're gonna hit an SLA as an example. But it's not just that you find these things, it's that you can actually apply them back in context. We put this back in context of the business, quite commonly what's happening with the services that you're exposing out to your customers, or topologies of your infrastructure as an example. And putting all that together, now you can drive some action. You can either auto remediate based on the pattern that it's seen. It can take some health self healing steps, such as ramping up additional EC2 instances or, you know, uh, moving traffic one direction or another. Right. The difference here is that the machine is the one who's sort of driving that decision in terms of I saw a pattern. I know what to do to respond to it. And it can do it proactively without your your without you having to interact with that as a human. And it can do with it based on patterns that you may not have noticed before. You know, in the traditional approach, someone had to sit there and code up what they want to do. Now the machine is sort of figuring out, yes, that's the right path to take. And then it comes back and we have this feedback loop of continuously optimizing things. So that's why it's sort of different. It, it starts off with aggregating everything together. It moves that traditional step three into step one, and then it, flips it around instead of applying a model and then deriving insights, it applies some insights and puts that in context. So that's why AI ops is a little bit different. Now I wanted to talk about how to start. So the gentleman before me, Brian, he was talking about that self-driving car. Just like that self-driving car, we want to, you're adopting this in stages and, and in series, right? Any customer, any self-driving car manufacturer out there today, they're sort of hedging on where they are. No one will claim they're completely self-driving. It's all steps that they're taking to move forward. And the SAE out, is out there talking about what those levels of automation may be, starting off with something like manual steering. You know, a lot of companies started doing things like blind spot warnings and shift alerts, adaptive cruise control, emergency braking, lane assist. This is where people have been moving to. In the future, they're looking at autonomous parking, or Ford is already there, highway assist point-to-point -point automated transport. You get into an, a car at the airport, takes you home, or takes you to a bus stop as an example, or fully anonymous driving. These are all stages that everybody is moving through. And just like that car, we're applying this to operations and bringing AI along slowly and helping it learn along the way to take it to where we actually want to be. So on the left, this is where we really start, getting that aggregated data into one place so we can sort of get rid of all the duplication, look at how do I do things like reporting and visualization in a better way than trying to figure out across 50 different screens what's going on, applying some simple things like anomaly detection or noise reduction, getting into that root cause determination analysis, moving on to how does it actually remediate for me or actually train the AI to do that self-healing operation before we let it run on its own and sit back with our hands up over our heads while it takes us uh, to our destination as an example. So, you know, from here, the easy place to start is that big data, bring it all together, figure out how to stream and look at it in real time, and over time, apply different algorithms to solve those different things that, are, that you're dealing with today. So, in trying to close this down, I know I'm near time, the benefits that we're seeing out of this, we're seeing faster MTTR, you know, better visualization, machine learning algorithms, finding these patterns, these anomalies, these unhealthy spots, offering predictions behind the scenes, Getting that up 80% you know, earlier, we've seen two to four hours before traditional tools were able to detect these things. This drives better efficiency. This allows us to optimize our costs, optimize our resources. So 
this helps address some of that a traditional way of working in a way that doesn't throw everything up in the air. It's really additive on top of what you have today by leveraging those tools that you have, but sort of fixing that right-hand side of the process in a more efficient way. So I want to thank everybody for letting me speak today. Uh, hope that this introduction on where we are and what's coming next is sort of helpful. And you'll see the ties between what Brian was talking about earlier and really what we're talking about here. So. The first place that we recommend is actually doing proactive automation. So with things like anomaly detection, these are some really simple things to get adopted. You know, we have a solution out there where you plug it in, takes about four weeks to figure out what's normal versus abnormal. It leverages that data that I talked about before, and it gives you the ability to alert earlier. And so you can do these predictive alerts that let you actually address things before you hit that SLA or before it impacts a customer. That's really the starting point for most people. Get that data together, process it, and find where things are trending in an unhealthy way, and then take some proactive action that you can actually code yourself using a lot of the systems that you have today. 